So there are a lot of problems with our economy that are only getting worse, from housing to crime to homelessness to so much more. And today we're having a discussion with one of the most outspoken left-wing political commentators who's made it very clear he's anti-landlord. Oh yeah, we have a very unique debate on that one. Where do you draw the line then between public housing and, and becoming a landlord? Do you think like a, a property like this should be owned by the government? Housing as a mechanism for, for capital accumulation has really perverted our understanding of housing. Mm. Housing okay. should be uh, decommodified. Anti-capitalist and also a democratic socialist. This one is going to be very unique and if you haven't seen it already check out last week's episode with Brett Cooper from The Daily Wire who is basically the exact opposite so we get to see both sides of the spectrum here but with that said thank you so much enjoy but first a message from our sponsor. Where's Jack? We got to start filming this podcast. Man. Yo, Grant, Mexico is fuego, and for you Americans, fuego means freaking sweet. First of all, Jack, that's not true, and second, turn down the music. We're gonna get copyright claimed. Oh, Grant, don't worry about it being demonetized. That's because they're playing music from our sponsor, Epidemic Sound, the best tool for creators to soundtrack their content without worrying about it being demonetized. We've been using Epidemic Sound for years, but before then, finding good copyright-free music was difficult. Every single track that we found was either not copyright-free or it was just really bad. Epidemic Sound has music that actually actually sounds good. They're suspenseful, fun, whimsical, foreign, or any other genre you might want to use. Plus, finding the right soundtrack could really enhance your video. And thankfully, Epidemic has 40,000 professionally produced tracks and over 90,000 sound effects that are exclusive to Epidemic Sound. But my favorite part has to be the new ear feature. Ear works like their Find Similar feature, which allows you to highlight a specific part of a track and search for music that sounds just like it. So if you're a content creator looking to soundtrack your content without worrying about copyright strikes, Epidemic Sound is my favorite recommendation. And with their 30-day free trial and 50% discount on personal and commercial plans, now is a better time than ever to get started. Click the link in the description to get a free 30-day trial and start creating your best quality content today. And now with that said, let's get to the podcast. I don't think I could ever go live like you do, man. I feel like uh, it takes... Bro, you, you have to be oh, like are so... You are you shipping that? Cause I'm saying no free promo. Oh, come man. on. Oh, Jack. okay. I, what if I want to give him promo? You go ahead, man. I want to give him promo. Fair Life is actually pretty fire. Yeah. I mean, their practices are absolutely the worst by, like, even dairy farmer standards. Why? Um, I think, like, the conditions that they keep the cows in is, like, worse than other farms. What do you learn something like that? I have a lot of vegans in my, a lot of radical vegans in my, in my community. One of my main editors is a vegan yeah. uh, propagandist, actually. Mm. So um, he constantly tries to sneak in stuff like that. See, I've constantly heard bad things about Nestle. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah for oh. sure. Like, what what yeah. is their deal? Do you know anything about them? Yeah, I mean, first of all, when you're in the water business, that's, uh, that's already pretty unethical. You How know so? what I mean? What do they do? Well, I mean... It's like something you need for survival, mm -hmm. and these guys are basically going to a local resource, like a natural resource, shutting off access to it, and then reselling it back to the people that live there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I would say that's like kind of problematic at least. Yeah. But then also on top of that, um, like on the chocolate front, they uh, utilize child slave labor. However, they outsource it to uh, you know third-party companies that are completely beyond their control. And uh, the the safety mechanisms that they've put in place, I think it's like the Chocolate Alliance, if I'm not mistaken, is like, it's like a regular NGO, you know, shady, uh, not exactly consistent. Um, and uh, as far as I understand, the United States Supreme Court ruled that Mars, Nestle, and other American-based or multinational corporations that utilize child slave labor, mm -hmm. Uh, are not uh, legally culpable for any of the damages if they were to ever be sued by the child slave um, laborers. Interesting. Um, Is that because that was a recent Supreme Court deniability case. that they could say, "Well, we hired this company, and we're not responsible for what that company does, and if yep. they do that, we don't know about it." Yeah. Is it one of those. Okay. It's one of those like, oh no, I can't believe the people that we outsource this like hiring process in in the global south is utilizing child slave labor like yeah. oh. but then again you know you got multiple states in the united states of america unwinding uh child labor laws so things are looking great here could you, like, wait could you yeah, explain, explain that it. yeah um i can i don't want to i don't want to mess this up we're pulling up on a sources podcast, here on the ice yeah. but i think this I, might be the first time we've had sources pulled up like this well, that's good we know it's yeah legitimate, uh, but our, you know? i i know arkansas <laughs> yeah. 
or what some people call Arkansas, but I call Arkansas. Uh, it was uh, recently making a move, and I think Idaho as well. Is it to lower the age that uh, a minor would be able to work? Or what is... Missouri Independent title says, Kids at work. States try to ease child labor laws at the behest of industry. Now, this, of course, is following like a, yeah. a sea of NLRB investigations that were conducted at uh, you know poultry plants where children were found. Hyundai had a facility in Alabama where children were actually working in the facility. Oftentimes, these are undocumented kids. Um, the the uh, the Hyundai facilities, I believe, in two different facilities, uh, they found children <laughs> all the way from like twelve to you know twelve year olds, fourteen year olds working at the facilities on the assembly line. Uh, there was another article. There was another investigation conducted where they found that uh, cleaning companies that they were utilizing late at night uh, were also you know hiring children. I would love to get more detail about exactly what they want to do because I know titles could be one thing, a title could be misconstrued, but I wouldn't be opposed necessarily if they if they make it easier for a teenager or someone who wants to work after school a certain amount of hours more access to be able to work if they want to. Yeah. But again, um, it depends on exactly well, what this says. I can tell you what it yeah. is. 11 states have done this and okay. they've either passed or introduced laws to roll back child labor laws. A push that's coming from industry trade organizations and conservative legislatures for the most legislators for the most part. Um, in the past two years, those states have moved to extend working hours for children, eliminate work permit requirements, and lower age for teens to handle alcohol or work in hazardous industries. That believe- would be an interesting one. Because Jack, you worked at a restaurant, but you couldn't serve the alcohol, correct. right? Yes, correct. Until no. I until I turn twenty one, but a lot of restaurants like they don't actually listen to that. Not trying to throw my old restaurant under the bus here, but <laughs> restaurants don't really adhere to that. Yeah, it does seem silly to me that if you have a server who who let's say is nineteen years old and is waiting on a table, they cannot bring a glass of alcohol to the people that they're waiting on, even if that person doesn't have a drink. Like some of these things, I think can be. But then again, I come from the perspective of like I loved working part time when I was like late middle school, high school, like that was the joy of my existence was being able to work. So I think it just comes down to like what those changes are. I think no children should work as a necessity. You know what I mean? Like part-time sure. labor, understandable. Um, if you want to do it um, to learn the value of a dollar or whatever, mm-hmm. certainly. And a lot of kids work in their like, you know, family businesses sure. and whatnot. But ultimately I think like, that genuinely harms your your development, your your you know capacity to learn when you're tired, fatigued, and you're you have this additional burden. I think this is a, a gigantic gigantic policy failure. I don't mean like I'm just I'm simply stating that the fact that that needs to happen in this country mm. is is pretty f-ed up. Let's get more onto that. Which, but before, uh, yeah, okay. I just wanted to say, sure. there is apparently, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, a 69% increase in children employed illegally by companies since 2018. Hmm. You know, child labor is on the rise. Yeah. I had no idea. Can you tell us a bit about your background, how you got involved in Twitch and general streaming? Um, sure. Like, take us back from like, you know, as, as a kid. So I grew up in Turkey. Um, to a relatively affluent family. And if you're like even rem- even a little bit affluent in Turkey because of how massive the wealth gap is in a country like that, you're, you know, you're caked up mm. uh, in comparison to like American standards where if a, a similar salary would not or a similar amount of wealth would not make you, uh, you know, upper middle class even. Sure. Such is the nature of, you know, developing nations. Um, but... Uh, by the time I got to college, my dad lost everything, right? Um, which is fine. I mean, I still had a lot of the benefits of a, a early upbringing. Yeah. Could you uh, tell us, do you mind telling us how he lost everything or what? Future trading. What, ha- what happened in that? Just exactly? gambled, basically. Yikes. Okay. You know? Had uh, he been doing that for a while and seen some success and then just kind of went all in on it or something? I, or? Yeah, pretty much, I think. I'm, not, I'm a little murky on the details. Like, I, I don't think he... He's never fully like brought it up, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, but he was he was successful. I mean, he was like lobbying the Turkish government. You know, he was he was uh, like the right hand man in a mm-hmm. holding group. You know what I mean? He was like 
he had some pretty serious uh, jobs. Um, but uh, once he once he got a little bit older and retired, he basically got into that and fucking lost everything. How old were you at the time? Um, I was around seventeen. Mm-hmm. Um, and then 18 when I went to college, when he like full blown mm-hmm. lost it all. Not that it really matters because like, like I said, I already got the the many benefits of growing up and, and getting the best education. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So at that point, it's like, it's fine. It's what other the benefits the were there besides a good education? Because you you were in I the mean, United States at that point, right? No, no not yet. No, no, okay. I'm in Turkey at got this it. point. Okay. I came to America when I was 18. Got it. I would visit the United States yeah. sometimes for summers and whatnot, which I would consider to be one of the benefits at yeah. least, you know what I mean? Um, but, uh, I mean, it, it's just freedom sure. to not have the, the economic insecurity. Even as a child, even if you don't recognize it, that still weighs on you, you know what I mean? In mm-hmm. ways that, like, your parents will be depressed in, in certain aspects, right? Like, that, that's, a, that's a lift that people that come from affluent backgrounds don't have to even think about. It's like a burden that doesn't exist. Didn't have to work. You know what I mean? Could, um, I mean, they were very particular about not getting me uh, things that I wanted, but you know, ultimately it doesn't matter because there were so many amenities that come along with that, that Mm -hmm. I, um, that I benefited from, which is something I talk about regularly. I mean, it was a fairly privileged background. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think that was probably my first, uh, that's when I first started developing an understanding or even recognizing income inequality was when I switched over from a private school to a public one. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized like, oh shit, like, you know, the gardener's kid and I'm I'm going to the same school and like, and this was when I was in third grade, I started realizing like, damn, the gardener's kid is not living like I am at all. You know what I mean? I think that was probably my first uh, recognition of, of wealth disparity, wealth inequality. Not like I wasn't like a socialist or anything. Right, you, know you weren't. I mean? really but as a kid, I was like, "Why the f- just?" Yeah, I was just like, "Why the f- does a kid not right. have anything?" You know what I mean? Fair. Yeah, like, yeah. what what made you say that though, or think that way? Like, what was it that that kid was lacking that you had? I mean, even like basic food items. Fair. You know what I mean? Like, you bring lunch to school, or there's a there's a commissary at school. I can buy whatever I want. He can't. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Things like that. Little things like that made me realize it. That um, there was something that was a little off. And what well. was your sentiment towards it at the time? Were you like, oh, I'm just happy that I'm one of the people, like a haver? Or was it something... I like, mean, I was uh, a kid. I didn't really like, yeah, think just, about it. Anything uh, beyond like observed. observing sure. it. Yeah. 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 Anything beyond the observation. I wasn't like, you know... I didn't have a, a, a revolutionary spark. Sure. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. 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 So then you're 18, you come to the United States, What's what happens there? And why did you come to the United States? Why here? I always wanted to come to America. When I was growing up, so you probably noticed that I don't have an accent. Yeah. And also, I have a pretty solid understanding of American culture as well, because I was immersed in it when I was growing up. Many people around the world are immersed in American culture. Obviously, it's like, you know, pretty profoundly successful. That's why you see the Taliban wearing like Oakley's and you know what I mean? Like these dudes were in a cave, you know, three months ago, and now they got like tactical, like American rifles, vests. They're wearing the the baseball caps and whatnot, and that's that's one aspect of like how powerful American culture is. Um, and I was certainly captivated by it. Other kids, they would ask other kids like, "What do you want to be?" And kids say, "I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a lawyer, maybe not really, or I want to be an engineer. I want to be a firefighter." I was like. I want to go to college in America. That was, it's so weird when I think about it, but that's all I wanted to do. America represented this freedom, right? The American dream. Like it was, it was, um, it was something I, I definitely uh, believed. Yeah. Paired up with also the social conservatism in Turkey that was like developing and, and became the Erdogan regime. Like the changes that I started seeing. Um, what were those changes, by the way? So Recep Tayyip Erdogan, this is a long story, yeah. but Recep Tayyip Erdogan is, is kind of like Donald Trump, but more successful even than Donald Trump. Sure. Um, he basically uh, ran on this like uh, anti-Western degeneracy. We need to go back to, you know, uh, uh, conservative values. 
while also, of course, privatizing a lot of you know key sectors in Turkey that were otherwise nationalized historically. Mm-hmm. Um, he came in, did all of that. Uh, and and of course, in order to maintain his popularity with a so, uh, with a socially conservative base of support that was all around the country and not necessarily reflected in the big cities, um, he had to keep uh, you know ramping up the intensity, talking about how like uh, Muslims, like the real Muslims, were oppressed in Turkey, a country with like ninety eight percent Muslim. You know what I mean? But um, that the the elitist Western facing Muslims were were, uh, you know, morally degenerate and ruining the country. They didn't care about the hardworking, real Muslims uh, in, in the villages and, mm-hmm. and in other places or even in big cities. They were not being reflected in policy. So that was his main method. That was his, like, culture war, basically, that he used to gain prominence. And it was very successful. I mean, he was pretty profoundly popular and also profoundly unpopular as well sure. but he still maintained like a a coalition of like 51 percent of the vote fair enough uh throughout his reign pretty much so you know some of the social changes i observed one of the dumbest ones i guess but like that i immediately recognized was i i love uh political cartoons political satire when i was growing up i used to read these comics that would come out weekly it was like a newspaper Mm. called penguin there was a couple other ones and they would regularly criticize Erdogan as political satirists too they would draw him as like different animals and he is a very thin-skinned man as uh, many of these petty tyrants are and he sued them he sued a bunch of them as a matter of fact and then that was kind of like a turning point um we don't have uh, an American understanding of free speech in Turkey. Erdogan himself actually went to jail for a poem and inciting violence mm. uh, originally uh, many, many years back, many years prior before he actually um, you know, ran for any position of power. But uh, he was now weaponizing that against his uh, you know, dissenters, basically. That was one of those things. Uh, there, was an, there was an element in the air of, of feeling as though, you know... Alcohol consumption was frowned upon, things of that nature. It was never fully regulated, obviously, because it's like a you know pretty solid sector. Tourism is something that Turkey relies on heavily, um, and you can't really shut that off, right? You can't just be like, oh, we're not going to, you know, you're not allowed. But it basically started giving voice to more social conservatives who then felt more empowered to be able to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, reinforce their ideas, no matter how backwards they were. So things of that nature. I started noticing that. I didn't like that. The free speech conversation is also a major one, considering that, uh, you know, Turkey does jail a lot of journalists and a lot of academics, like famously. Mm -hmm. One of the worst in the country, one of the worst on the planet. Um, America is still the number one jailer across the board, but Turkey jails a lot of academics and a lot of like dissenters, basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that was not something I was fond of. But, you know, paired up with that, seeing America as it's, you know, this this beacon of moral degeneracy that I thought was awesome uh, and, and, you know, rampant consumption that I also thought was awesome because I'm a bit of a hedonist. Uh, I, I wanted to come to America. It represented the, this like, you know, this beacon of freedom. Sure. Something that a lot of people that, you know, actually immigrate to the United States, if they have, are fortunate enough to do so, uh, this, is a, this is a thing that they see from wherever they live because there's so much wealth here yeah there's so much money and uh opportunity you know. too that's something that i've seen with a lot of people who've immigrated here they're like there's so much opportunity everywhere yeah. you go for sure the, the possibilities are limitless yeah absolutely in yeah. comparison to other countries okay. yeah oh certainly. yeah totally and so what was your experience then going to college um i went to college first i came to university of miami it was a degenerate I partied a lot, I had two nines both semesters. My parents were like, that is the most unacceptable thing on the planet. Like, how dare you? They were already upset that I chose University of Miami over mm. Boston mm. or even George Washington University where I got like really fat scholarships from, as a matter of fact. Um, so when I chose that, when I chose University of Miami, they were already frustrated. What was your reasoning behind picking Miami? Oh, I wanted to have fun. That was it? Yeah, no, I, 100%. 
You see I, the videos of like spring break there, man. It looks no. Oh, it's crazy. And was it fun? How was it? It was a lot of fun, yeah. But so was Rutgers, honestly, mm -hmm. which is where I inevitably uh, transferred to. Yeah. Um, and then, but Rutgers was in New Jersey, and I hated the weather, and I just did not like living in New Jersey at all. Um, throughout that time, also, I started slowly but surely. That's when I started to like uh, genuinely recognizing uh, what was profoundly wrong with America. Uh, one of the one of the most significant radicalizing components for someone like myself was healthcare. Like seeing the fact that coming from a country where there is private healthcare, but also yeah. public healthcare to a certain degree, like you can still get uh, you know public healthcare um, completely free that the government pays for, right? Um, seeing that like uh, you had to pay an insane amount of money to just get like basic procedures. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, this is like unacceptable. And um, it didn't make sense to me at all. I always are also had a negative opinion of America's foreign policy as someone who didn't live in America. So that was already there. And that's when I started, uh, you know, moving more into my current beliefs. Hmm. What about foreign policy do you think was, was the most broken from your perspective? <sighs> I mean, where do I begin? Everything America does is pretty awful in, in terms of foreign policy. It's always done at the behest of uh, not some like, uh, you know, democratizing principle right. as the way they present it here, but instead to make money for the military industrial complex, which is like one of our most viable industries, right? And, uh, you know, there's obviously different layers to it. Resource extraction is a huge component. Um, whether it be illicit and like, uh, you know, uh, uh, d not on the books resource extraction or control, like, you know, opium fields mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, uh, that are being controlled or protected by the Marines that have no fucking clue what they're doing there in Afghanistan, uh, even though that, that those opiates inevitably make their way, not into America, mind you, we have fentanyl that's coming from China that's different, or uh, any kind of other uh, natural minerals, natural resources, or even uh, uh, even maintaining a country's economic status so that you can take advantage of their labor force at a much, much, uh, you know, at a much lower price. Do you think price. America does that? Oh, absolutely. I think I, I think the entirety of the West does that. And I do believe that they they do it fairly deliberately. I feel like it's, I've always kind of in the back of my mind thought about it. If you're giving jobs to these third world countries, right? Like the little, like n not like the sewing jobs and stuff like that, like creating materials and stuff, the sweatshops. I wonder if that, I always wondered if that was a ploy to keep them because it's such low paying jobs. It's just enough to get by and survive to like make sure that they still stay at the end of the, the crack like of the whip. Or something. That's, that's most jobs. Jack. I feel like most jobs that pay like 50 to 7 70k a year you are think just it's good just and, enough I think, to keep someone under submission like yeah oh, oh yeah is, I, I would say most jobs keep you just at the neutral point where you don't want to leave but it's good enough where you want to stay that's where i feel like most okay so you don't want to you don't want to recognize that you're you're being bagged into a corner so much so that you're both hungry and angry because inevitably you'll bite back right if you are relatively comfortable through uh you know a, a ton a metric ton of commodities that you can consu uh, consume consume mm -hmm. and cheap cheap consumer goods uh, for the most part um you'll you'll forget that the cost of healthcare has skyrocketed the cost of college education right. which is like one of the most significant at, as it stands one of the most significant ways of upward social mobility which is not even that good anymore right but the prices have still increased the cost of housing is is has dramatically increased um but hey, we get really cheap TVs. What I wonder to like, like, how do you solve that problem? Because if you just abandon ship and you, you take all of those businesses that were using those resources over there, then they don't have jobs at all. And do you think that they would have to fend for themselves and then create something better, like internally, or do you think that it's upon their government to to do something for them? I think China is a pretty good example of like what has been done um, with respect to taking in foreign capital and then spreading it out as best as possible and like immediately developing uh, a lot of the underdeveloped parts. I mean, if you look to like the past 30 years of Chinese development and you look at the current Chinese economy in comparison to where it was before foreign capital started flooding in uh, and, and uh, you know, before they started 
taking advantage of their manufacturing power and also, you know, ripping the IP as, as uh, aggressively as they could perfectly openly, by the way. And, and our capital owners also like the business owners here know that, right. It's not a secret, mm -hmm. but they still want the cheap manufacturing. So they just were like, yeah, whatever, who cares? Um, but I think their development has been pretty solid as a consequence of that. It's about how evenly you distribute the resources once you start getting in a, a load of foreign capital. Do you trust their numbers, though? Because I've, I've heard quite a bit that they could manufacture their own profits and, and a lot of the buildings they've built are built on, you know, invisible money that was just basically taken from the people who invest and builders use it and then plow, you know, plow it into the next development and... I mean, I see yeah. it. I look at their railroads. I look at high-speed rail. Like, if you pull up a map of, like, high-speed rail in China from 2000 to now, fast, yeah. in comparison to, you know, high-speed rail in America, which is non-existent, I think that that's, like, pretty even development in a country. There is the... We were looking at, like, ghost cities yesterday. Yeah. Because people immediately are like, well, what about the ghost cities? Yeah. I think that was a combination of, like, make work, which I do think is uh, something that every good government should do. Make work, like busy work. Construction being one of those uh, ways of doing that and and uh, thinking that the the population was going to grow more than it actually did. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this happens in not only centrally planned economies, but it happens in America as well. Um, not to the same degree, but a lot of those ghost cities are now actually becoming more and more populated because uh, because those there is need for uh, a developed city. Like people want to move to a place where, you know, if, if they move certain things around, and that is an advantage that centrally planned economies have, if you move certain things around, you can move people there as well. People want to go to a place where they can get better educational opportunities, for example. So that's what they do. They'll be like, all right, we're going to put some really good schools here. So then people start moving into what was before a ghost city. So I think that there's a lot of confusion and a lot of chaos uh, about what gets talked about with respect to china um i mean there are obviously awful things that the chinese government has done just like any other government has you know make no mistake i'm not avoiding those realities um but i think overall they have developed incredibly well especially if you look to where they were 20 30 years ago or where they were 100 years ago mm -hmm. i mean it's it's insane and, you know, this is not just my analysis of the situation. If you look to like, uh, I don't know, the World Trade Organization, whenever someone says capitalism has been profoundly good in like eviscerating global poverty, extreme poverty at the global level, they're pretty much just talking about China. Like the Chinese numbers really, really skyrocket that that performance. If you leave China out of the equation, um, and obviously I'm not like, um, the World Trade Organization and I have, you know, or, or these institutions have a profoundly different worldview than I do, right? But even they recognize that. They just say it's because of capitalism. I say it's because of resource allocation, like a more equitable mm. distribution of resources. My biggest issue is that we have no way of verifying what China says is true. And that's my biggest concern. Have you ever been to China? Never. I haven't either. I really want to go. I just look to tier one cities sure. and think that like Shenzhen, as far as I've seen yeah. from people that have traveled, as far as I read on, on the matter from, again, Western outlets ultimately, right? Which uh, usually will have a bias that is, I would say, anti-China because they see it as like in contention sure. to American, uh, you know, uh, American power, Western power, right? Um even they recognize the development. So, you know, I, I, I feel like, I feel like it's definitely there. Yeah. Let's get back onto that after we finish the story. Cause we left off with yeah. you being like 18 or so in college, you end up transferring to Rutgers. What happened there? And then how did you get to where you are today from that? I graduated from college. Can't get a job. Obviously I graduated with honors actually uh, poli sci degree. What was that? What changed between Miami and, and Rutgers? I just realized like I have to, you know, I have to work hard work together. <laughs> yeah, to yeah, I had to get my hard. shit together. Yeah, okay. Was there a pivotal moment that happened for you that was like your wake up call, or was it just gradual over time? No, it was just gradual. Okay, because like I think um, American school is like fairly easy, 
in comparison to, you know, what I had to learn in school in Turkey. Mm. So I was just like really phoning it in. So I decided not to phone it as much. You know what I mean? Sure. So that's, that's pretty much it. And when you're a freshman, you don't really know what you're going to do. So you have to take a lot of like, you know, common core mm -hmm. style classes. And those foundational classes are often like very difficult, especially if it's not something that you're truly interested in. Whereas poli sci was something I was interested in. So it was a lot easier for me. Yeah. Like well, it came naturally. What was the job you wanted to get? So you must have graduated what, 2014 or 15? 2013. 2013. The job I wanted yeah. to get originally was, and this is funny, uh, a consultant in one of the big four firms. Really? So originally I was like, this is, I, you know, I have a poli sci background. I could probably go to like, you know, PwC, McKinsey, one of those companies. You know what I mean? That's what I was like trying to get hired by. But of course, that's all like wheeling and dealing, sure. who you know. And I did not know anybody. So they just, <laughs> I don't even think anyone even looked at my resume, right? Could it be GPA too? Do you have a good grade? I did, yeah. yeah I, okay. Like I said, I graduated with honors, sure. 375. Got it. Okay. So, you know, that's like pretty solid, yeah. I, I would say. Um, and uh, my dad was like, you have to go to like law school or get an MBA or something, right? Uh. And I was not really necessarily interested in that. So I was just like, yeah, sure. I'll study for law. I still, I'll study for my LSATs in California, Los Angeles. At the time, uh, you guys probably know this, but if you don't, my uncle has a YouTube channel mm -hmm. called The Young Turks. It was like a 26 person shop. It was like a you know tiny operation not that big, mm -hmm. not that media behemoth yeah. or anything. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'll just go work with him, do an internship with him and I'll live in LA and I'll study for the LSATs with, I had no interest in studying <laughs> for the LSATs yeah. or going to fucking law school. Um, so yeah, I started working there and then I was like, yeah, maybe I should just like work with him instead. And at first it was really awful because I had no money and the Young Turks didn't have any money either. So they were like, yeah, we want to we wanna do a biz dev. We want to do like, we want you to fill the role of someone who would be doing like our direct advertisement sales in-house rather than, uh, rather than someone who, uh, rather than having Google do it, right? Mm -hmm. Like bringing in sponsorships every now and then rather than, you know, relying on YouTube, we want someone to do it internally. So I basically set up our in-house advertisement sales and operations. A lot of cold calling, a lot of learning. I didn't know anything about it. I, didn't, I just knew the industry a little bit, but that's how I got my start at the Young Turks. Was it like commission-based or was it salary? It was supposed to be like uh, commission-based, but you know, when you put a 22-year-old in a job like that, in a position like that, and it's commission-based, mm -hmm. And the product that you're like trying to sell is kind of hard to sell because it's like political commentary, political news. And you're going for a lot of like DR campaigns, right? Or where, uh, you know, with... That's what you're trying to sell to? Well, I, I had to, yeah, I had to get like, I brought in like Squarespace, Crunchyroll, things oh, like sure. that. Yeah, yeah. And and through, through like, uh, you know, they weren't necessarily tier one, uh, uh, you know, ad companies, I would mm -hmm. say. They weren't like tier one marketing companies like... I would meet up with them, like OMD, all these like big brands, you know, it was, I think it was Ogilvy was another one. I can't even remember now, but you know, I was cold calling a lot. I was developing uh, relationships with these people while also simultaneously on the back end, like trying to create a system, like trying to create the structure so we can like actually deliver these ads, all this stuff. Um, and I brought in a bunch of, uh, I brought in a bunch of campaigns, but they were all like, you know, CTR, uh, CTR based, like that was the that was yeah. the performance mm -hmm. that they wanted, and it's just like the shittiest type of ads. I'm sure you guys have them too, still to this day. Um, I wanted to do like native advertising. I thought that would be cool, but at the time, you know, people weren't really uh, willing to take a bet. I think we were too ahead of the game in that mm -hmm. respect, and um, I brought that stuff in, but it was so awful i mean i fucking hated sales what did you not like about it i just it sucks man come on you, you i'm sure you guys have done sales in some capacity yeah, i loved it yeah i fucking yeah, but, hated yeah. it it's just like i 
I don't want to, I don't want to be friends with these fucking people. You know what I mean? I just like, I feel like you have to be a sociopath a little bit to be like really good no, at it. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I, he no. was an agent. I for loved like it. I was, years. I was a real estate agent for ten years, so that's how I got started in sales. Before that, yeah. though, it wasn't really sales, but kind of. I worked at a marine aquarium wholesaler, so mm-hmm. we would sell fish and coral. And it wasn't really like a sales. I didn't have to pitch anybody, but someone would call in and ask about something and I would describe it to him over the phone. Like I didn't get commissions oh, or anything. I was anything, getting but no inbound it. requests. I was all yeah. fucking, I was all out. That's going to make it obviously less So fun. It I mean, is- I was doing the same thing. I was calling up people from open houses who would sign in and talk to them. But I felt like sales provides a service where if they're looking for something, if you could help them find that something, you're doing them a service. So it's very much a customer service based industry. One other thing I did while all of that was going on was I always wanted to be on camera, but I was dog shit like i was so bad at it right i was not good i don't think anyone is really that good i love talking Mm. but i was very nervous on camera at first like when the when the camera light was on i was a different person almost i couldn't let my personality out but at that point i'd realized that like repetition and hard work for someone like myself um i was able to achieve a lot of the things as long as i just like fucking boulder through it you know push push through it doesn't matter if i suck at first who gives a shit it's embarrassing but it doesn't matter um so i would present myself as a fill-in host because i looked at all these other hosts and it's a youtube show Mm. you know these guys don't know anything more than i do they're just you know they're a little bit more charismatic sure they have more experience on camera but i don't think they're bringing anything particularly new to the table it's a fucking youtube show you know and i was like i could do that i want to do that So I would say, if someone needs a fill, I'll do it. Last second, doesn't matter. Don't care what the subject matter is. I'll read on it. I'll speak on it. I'll do it. So that's why I started doing, um, that's why I started doing more, um, you know, on-camera appearances at first. Was that uh, like a teleprompter or were they giving you a topic and you'd have to research that and speak on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No teleprompter at this point. Okay. And then I uh, was, was living with one of the producers at the time. Um, for one of the one of the media properties there, uh, on the entertainment side, and I pitched him the idea. The Young Turks at this point had no teleprompter shows. I pitched him the idea of doing a teleprompter show. They had a studio that was basically just like a supply closet. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'm gonna put a fucking green screen in here, and I'm gonna do a show out of this. Uh, I'm I'm gonna give you like a free show. You know, I'm just doing extra work, right? And, you know, it took a lot of convincing, but ultimately he was like, sure, whatever. I mean, we live together. It's, uh, you know, I'm greasing his wheels that way, I guess. I'm going to call it the breakdown. And everyone was like, oh, we're just going to be a drain on our resources. 30 million fucking views every week. It was Facebook. 30 million views a week. Oh, yeah. Was that monetized? It was monetized at that point, was it? No. Oh, so this is, but it's, it's so much reach for you guys. Yes. Wow. So, you know, it became this thing that was insanely popular. Facebook was skyrocketing. Like our Facebook growth was insane. Tremendous. Who who is the audience at that point? Who the audience was? I don't really know what the demographics were, but I I would say they're still 18 to 35, you know, like the key target demo. I probably was a little bit younger. Like Facebook at that point was like, more popular i would say than it is now Mm -hmm. with younger demographics this is when people were like moving away they had snapchat as an alternative but like there wasn't that many viable alternatives right um and it was it was just doing tremendously well Uh, i was doing these things where i would just do like a back and forth with tommy lauren do you guys remember who that is she was back and forth with her so we never collaborated but she would make a video And I would piece by piece go through her video and just like dunk on everything she was saying. It was, I think like this wasn't as popular as it is now. Everyone does it now, right? Everyone does it on TikTok. Everyone does it on YouTube. But at the time it was like kind of unique, especially to the political sphere. And it was still scripted. It was still teleprompted. And I had like all these assets that I would bring in. Um, And it, it, it was really, it was... For a brief moment, I think I captured the attention of like a massive group of people, but it was still under the TYT umbrella. I did not have any ownership of this IP. I did not have anything. What's uh, like, I have no control over it. You know what I mean? And I would constantly say, give me more funds so I can hire a writer, 
give me more funds so I can like beef up this process. Um, and instead of doing that, what did TYT do? They said, no, we're just going to take the breakdown, your baby, your child, this thing that you've made, and we're going to make all the other hosts do it as well, which will dilute the, the brand and sure. what my vision for it was. Uh, so now you have to train everyone just like you've trained your editors to be able to do this kind of content. And you have to also help them, you know, make the show because my job isn't making a show. My job at that point is building our Facebook operations, right? Like mm -hmm. growing our Facebook operations. I hated that. That was when I realized like fully that I just have no control over my life whatsoever. This is a reality that many people face and unfortunately can't really escape because, you know, they can't become entrepreneurs because that is a, you know, massive, massive risk. It was one that I was able to do. Um, eventually, I uh, by January 2020. Uh, before that, I, I went part time with the Young Turks because uh, I I wanted my own thing. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself here yeah. a little bit. I'm jumping. Um, what ended up happening is I realized I, I needed my own thing after that. When they did that, I, I needed to no longer be in the shadow of the Young Turks. No longer be in the shadow of my uncle. Because no matter what I did, everyone was like, nepotism. That's the reason why you're successful. Nepotism. That's the reason why your Facebook, you know, shit's popping off. Mm -hmm. Nepotism. It's like, well, he's not doing fucking Facebook videos. Oh, yeah, like, what right. do you mean? He, he literally can't. Like, <laughs> you know? Um, so I was always, like, trying to move the audience from TYT Properties to something that I own. Like, you know, my Instagram. Yeah. They were not too fond of that. At first, they didn't give a shit, but then they realized, like, oh, fuck, this guy's, like, kind of using our network to, like, build his own brand. I don't like it. Um, then I started Twitch because I was very bad off the cuff. I wanted a place where I could go to every day, build a community around it. I wanted something that was mine, and I wanted to be able to start speaking off the cuff. What better way to learn how to speak off the cuff than speak off the cuff for eight hours a fucking day to an audience even? You know, have a back and forth. And I also was a gamer already. Mm -hmm. And I saw the gaming space as one that was like actually very diverse and had a lot of like progressive opinions. But unfortunately, if you looked at like the gaming adjacent content creators, none of them were really openly leftist or anything like that. They were all actually very right wing. You had the you had a lot of like actually far right content creators even that were doing like commentary and essays. So we're, you know, Gamergate had happened and Everyone was talking about like, you know, how video games are political and and that meant like there was like a black woman in the video game. You know what I mean? Not Call of Duty, though. Call of Duty was not considered political. Um, so it was a lot of commentary like that, which is why I was like, no, there's there's uh, there's definitely demand for this. Um, my kind of politics mm -hmm. with my understanding of memes, Internet culture, all that sort of stuff. And Twitch was the best place to go to do that because it was a video game platform. Mm -hmm. So that's when I made the move to start doing my Twitch, which was very tiny at the time, wasn't anything. And I started building it up slowly but surely. And by the time 2019 came around, it was at least like respectable. You know what I mean? I was I was reaching like sometimes 5,000 concurrent viewership. That's oh, wow. That's, that's more amount. than respectable. Yeah. yeah. That's really good. I mean, well, in comparison to where I'm at now, it was at the time, it was like not that big, right? Mm -hmm. um, How were people finding you at that point? Was it just Twitch was pushing you to the top because people no. were No. A big part of it was networking. There were content creators that I collaborated with. Um, that I, I basically would do content with. It was a mutually beneficial situation. Trainwreck TV was one of them that does like debates or would, do, would host like this podcast that was live. I would go on that all the time. There was another show uh, by a, a friend of mine who I now do a podcast with called, uh, well, at the time it had a different name, but his name is Austin Show. Um, he had like these massive uh, debates for uh, that, that you know, basically everyone on the platform would be watching. At the time, it was like 35K live concurrent viewership, which was like you're maxing out at that point, right? For any kind of like non-Fortnite, you know, non-gaming uh, content. And um, that's pretty much how I, how I uh, grew uh, 
my my uh, platform. There was another content creator yeah. who I'm no longer friends with, but Destiny, mm -hmm. uh, who's uh, who I collaborated with a lot as well yeah. uh, early on. So how often were you working at the YouTube channel and doing Twitch? How did you balance the two? I, it was probably, 2019 was probably the worst. There was no balance. No time for friends, no time for relationships, no time for family. I would wake up at uh, around 5.30 in the morning, start reading and writing my script. I would go into the studio, shoot the video, have all the assets prepared, um, would drive back home after 2, 2 p.m. It was like usually, you know, it was uh, 6.37 to 2 p.m. is what my working time frame was for the Young Turks. Um, but then I was still on call. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, it wasn't like I was done, right? I, I would have to upload the video myself to Facebook. That was my job as well. I would have to do the SEO for it, thumbnails, all that sort of stuff. Make the thumbnails, make the SEO. Um, and I would drive back home, take my dog to the dog park, make my first meal of the day, basically, cook it as quickly as I could, go work out at the gym. Um, and while I'm doing all of that, uh, by the time, you know, it was like 5 p.m. at this point, basically, you know, the video would be ready to publish, publish the video, go live on Twitch, and then from like 5 p.m., 6 p.m. to like 11 p.m., I was live streaming on Twitch as many hours as I could. And what was the motivation for doing that? Was it to build Twitch up enough that you could leave? The motivation was so that, well, one, I, uh, the motivation was that I, I wanted to, a, a place that I could like go back to like a, a, a community. You know what I mean? Um, another motivation for me was just like, you know, have some independence outside of the young Turks, like a brand, uh, of my own, you know, something that people can point to and say, that's Hassan. That's Hassan Piker. Yeah. Not at the Young Turks, like individually. That's fair. So that was my most, uh, you know, those were the, the primary motivators. And also be able to learn how to speak off how the cuff. How much were you making at the time between working like what seems to be 16 hour days, like every single day? Before I left UIT, I think my salary was around like 65 grand. Sure. Which, you know, for <laughs> LA standards is not great. Um and on top of that, it was like whatever I was making on Twitch. I think I said I would go independent. Like I started thinking or teasing out like possibly going independent. Um, what was it 5,000 subs or 10,000 subs? I can't remember. Which, you know, after the Twitch pay cut is a lot of money. It's like yeah. another additional on top of that, like around, what is it? Like 20 grand, mm -hmm. 25 grand, um, something like that. Um, so, you know, that was, that was, I thought enough, uh, for me to withstand the, the possibility of like losing healthcare and everything else, which was something that I had to, you know, struggle with. It was something that I was genuinely fearful of. Yeah. Something that a lot of people have to think about if they have to make that jump on their own. So that's, uh, that's how that worked out for me. So when did you make the jump full time to Twitch? August 21st, 2019 comes around. Yeah. And I say something that in a heated gaming moment that uh, I still stand by in principle and also like, uh, you know, as long as I elaborate what it what the intention behind what I said was, I said America deserved 9-11. Oh, I've, yeah, I've seen yeah. that clip. Everyone's seen that clip at this point. I mean, that shit went on Fox News. I remember being fucking terrified, like uh, it immediately Keemstar elevated it. Then... Like, I mean, people clipped it out. Keemstar escalated it. It just like, elevated it, put it out there, uh, you know, broad daylight. And in that, uh, in a span of 24 hours, it was on Fox News. It made it to Tucker Carlson. It made it to Laura Ingram. Laura Ingram was calling Dan Crenshaw in to, like, respond to it. Because I also said some stuff about Dan Crenshaw as well. And I remember thinking, like, I'm so fucking, I'm, I'm killed. I'm going to be murdered. Well, I, you know, I, I'd been getting death threats at that point pretty regularly, but like it was on Fox News now. How many people were watching you when you said that live? I don't remember, but it wasn't that big. It, it just like it doesn't matter once it's out there. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter once once you that's how this works. You know, it doesn't matter. You, you got 2000 people, let's say, watching or 5000 people, let's say, watching. And then it gets in front of a much larger audience of people that are like, oh, fuck this guy. He's Muslim socialist guy. He's saying America deserves 9-11. He like loves Al-Qaeda. 
You know what I mean? Which wasn't my point at all. It was actually the opposite. But that made its way to Fox News. And I remember thinking, oh, shit. If Fox and, it's, if Fox and Friends covers this in the morning, I know Donald Trump watches Fox and Friends. If Fox and Friends covers this in the morning, I'm fucking screwed. Because Donald Trump might tweet about it. And if he does that, I'm dead. Like, they're going to murder me. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no way I survive that. Right? Um... And it was probably one of the worst uh, weeks, months of my life. It's something that, you know, people still uh, bring all the time, but I don't really give a shit. Uh, but uh, at the time, I was still like a TYT guy. And so people were sending death threats to like everyone at the Young Turks, like literally everyone down to like the key mm -hmm. grip. You know what I mean? Like they found anyone and everyone that works at the Young Turks and would like dox them and say that they're going to fucking come murder them. Um, that's when I realized, like, you know, maybe I should uh, do this on my own. Like, I don't want other people to be suffering the consequences of my fucking stupid mouth and not being able to, like, fully uh, elaborate on, yeah. on things what, or what not were, get clip chimped, yeah. really. What were you trying to get across when you said that comment? You know, the 20th year, uh, the 20th anniversary of 9-11 of really uh, was an interesting moment for me because everything that I said at that on that broadcast basically uh things that i already knew was reinforced through every documentary that came uh, out in that in that time frame talking about our uh arming and radicalizing of the mujahideen uh in the lead up to the civil war in afghanistan and the ussr invasion of afghanistan and how much the cia very openly uh elevated these these otherwise like random groups of militants into a viable and robust anti-Soviet uh, violent force. They did it through, uh, you know, Islamic fundamentalism that they instilled upon uh, people, then legitimized. Um, and then some of those groups became the Taliban, right? They started infighting. Some of those groups became the Taliban, and America was directly involved in this, and very openly, um, even before uh, Ronald Reagan famously brought them to the White House and said they reminded the Mujahideen reminded him of the founding fathers. Um, so that's what I was talking about because it was in response to what Dan Crenshaw was saying about how, you know, 9-11 happened because they hate us. Like they hate us because they hate us. That's it. And it was, uh, it was very frustrating for me to see like a dude who went, served overseas, got his eye blown out, right? To, to come back and just like keep reinforcing that same cycle of violence uh, and, and even using his like veteran status as a way to just like send more men and women overseas to get their shit blown off for no fucking reason. You know what I mean? So um, you're saying they have a reason to dislike us, but not deserving to happen to innocent people? Yes. I never, I never meant that obviously like the 3,000 people that died on 9-11 yeah. deserve to die. That's fucking ridiculous. I was simply talking about America's uh, chickens coming home to roost. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is a, this in, at least in yeah. academic circles or even in most circumstances, this is something that like every American kind of understands and, and recognizes. You know what I mean? Like we constantly fuck their shit up over there. Eventually some of those guys are going to come back and like, you know, do, do a little bit of whiplash, like come back and, and strike back. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that was the point. Many such examples. It's a concept called blowback. Um, and, uh, and I think the, the, uh, the way that, uh, the media actually started covering in the 20th anniversary of, of 9-11 and the Afghan invasion reflected all of the talking points that I was making at the time, which is why I had a lot of people actually come back and be like, listen, I misunderstood what you were saying at the time, but I totally get it now. Did that not make you really concerned about what you say when you go live and how things could yeah. be taken out of con? Did you change the way that you would speak after that to be more careful or considerate of like, you have to be very literal in what you say because things will be taken out of context? Absolutely. Okay. I, uh, I call it Twitter speak. Yeah. There's a way that people speak if they're on Twitter all the time where they want to make sure that nothing that they say can be uh, you know, intentionally misconstrued um, and if you ever use like any kind of spicy language or if you embellish it all, if you exaggerate, like people will weaponize that against you, they'll use it against you. Um, it's, it's certainly something that I, uh, I, I, uh, have, have, uh, cared about a lot more. Yeah. Like I take into consideration a lot more now. Yeah. 
I'm also curious, did any of that online hate translate in person? I mean, I don't usually talk about that because, yeah. you know, I don't want to I don't want to give any power to it. Fair but enough. it's just, uh, you know, it is what it is. OK, it happens. Got it. But uh, no, for the most yeah. part, uh, out in public, when I meet people, uh, no, it's an overwhelmingly positive experience. It's always just like, you know, people that work at the restaurants I go to or, uh, you know, people that are uh, union activists and leaders that are, you know, saying, look, I love your I love your show. Yeah. Uh, you gave me the confidence to go out and, 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 you know, fight for my rights in the workplace, things of that nature. It's, it's usually, it's overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. And what was the outcome of like your next live stream after that comment? <sighs> well, I got banned. You got banned? For a week. Yes. Because, you know, obviously right, when, right. when, you know, when, when something that you say uh, on a live stream becomes a matter of national news, especially in a negative way, you're probably going to get banned. Mm -hmm. Twitch immediately took action, got banned for a week. Um, and then I, uh, you know, I came back. And when you get banned and you come back, a lot of there's always like a big boost. <clears throat> a lot of people pay attention to that. So this is something I actually wanted to get your opinion on. Universal basic income. What are your thoughts on that? Um, Cause that would give a lot of people that autonomy to be able to be their own boss to a certain extent and yeah. pursue other creative ventures. UBI is actually a very good idea, but it can be a very bad idea as well. What do I mean by that? UBI is, uh, the problem with UBI is that if it's used as a way to further cripple the social safety nets, the existing social safety nets that are already in a state of disarray, then it's not good. Just a cash injection with no that that basically eats away at like EBT, SNAP credits, and and you know uh, social security and whatnot would be devastating, because well, I feel like that yeah. would open up the avenue to further privatize these uh, institutions that the government is supposed to be controlling. So that is something that I'm very fearful of. But as a concept, if UBI on top of that was supplementary, great. I'm well, let on me board. ask you this: Do you feel like a person would be able to better manage? money like that than the government would like let's just say hypothetically you do get rid of all the other social services but in its place you go right to the person you say you get twenty two hundred dollars a month or two thousand no. dollars a month no, you don't feel horrible. like a person would manage better. absolutely not Why is some that? people might but no i'm of the mindset that people are not very smart and as a whole and when we're when we think about every single person i'm a dumbass okay I don't want to manage all of that stuff. Someone should manage all of that stuff. And I think that leaving it up to a, a governing body is always going to be, especially, I mean, even though it's like devastatingly crippled, it's awful uh, for the most part, and it's not significant enough. Uh, I still think that uh, having it be regulated uh, through a, a, uh, a body that is still somewhat accountable through the democratic processes is the is the right thing to do in theory in practice obviously our institutions are are purposely crippled undermined underfunded um and uh, left to starve and die out so that you can privatize it basically but i am i am uh i'm a firm believer that you know having that uh, having that safety net is is really, really important. There are plenty of examples of this being super successful. I mean, every Nordic country that you look to, social democracies that you look to in Europe, there are, you know, very different ways of doing things, but mm -hmm. ultimately the, the principle behind it is still the same. Socialization is, is uh, a, a necessity, I would say. And um, yeah, what things do you think should be socialized? I think healthcare is one of, one of the items that you mentioned. And you're not going to like what I'm about to say. And I know what you're about to say. Yeah. But <laughs> you we, know. Can, we, can, we can talk. Let's I'm more than happy to talk about it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I things that have inelastic demand, necessities for survival, should certainly have at least like a comfortable bottom mm -hmm. that the government should provide. What do I mean by this? I, I'm not saying that we should like completely eradicate the private sector in all aspects of our development or, or all, all aspects of commodity develop, uh, you know, commodity production. Um, well, maybe in the future, that could be something that we could do, not in the short term, of course. Um, but healthcare certainly should be nationalized, but you can't nationalize healthcare without also having free college because you don't want doctors to get you know, into $500,000 in debt 
and then go work at a you know go work at a public facility for pennies on the dollar and and not be able to even pay that debt back. Um, plenty of countries have recognized this, and that's the reason why they also offer uh, free education. Uh, even America has kind of been forced to recognize this reality, uh, and you know you see schools like NYU and and New York schools like New York colleges trying to create a scholarship process so that you know doctors can get educated for free or at least like have heavily subsidized education um i also think you know what i want to say <laughs> housing Ooh, okay. should be uh decommodified what do i mean by that i think we all agree that housing should uh, i mean housing is a necessity for survival mm -hmm. for that reason i believe that um housing as a mechanism for for capital accumulation has really uh, perverted our understanding of housing and has created glaringly obvious uh, uh, problems in America, but especially in a place like California, where, uh, what is it, 43.7% or 43.7% uh, people for every like 100,000 people is, is uh, homeless here. It's like an insane number. I, I don't want to mess the numbers up. Yeah. Now, but we are number one. Yeah. My understanding with homeless, though, is that a lot of people come to California specifically because of the weather and because of some of the social services that are offered here. Part of me believes homelessness is not necessarily a California problem, but it's a countrywide problem. Someone could be homeless Certainly. in, let's say, Nevada, and they get a one-way ticket to California. And that's Nevada's solution, by the way, to homelessness. Oh, 100%. Yeah, that was California's like, solution to homelessness was to ship them to Hawaii back in the day. Yeah. Another state so with a lot of homelessness. I feel like it's it's California's bearing a lot of the burden of a nationwide crisis of homelessness. That it's not just because California real estate's expensive, but it's also because the weather and I think the location really support people who have no other place to live but on the street because of the weather. There is some truth to the way that like Texas or red states deal with homelessness as a problem. What you're what you're mentioning, there's truth to that. But ultimately, um, there are countries that have been able to eviscerate homelessness without shipping them to other places. You know what I mean? Uh, countries that do a much better job uh, of of tackling the issue through policy uh, than than we do here in California. And it's not like they're killing their homeless people, like they're housing them. Yeah. Uh, and the reality is that, uh, you know, public housing as, or, or even like, uh, like decoupling housing from uh, the profit motive is 100% is a necessity to solve uh, homelessness. Because other than the people that are being shipped to California, let's say, the reason why we have so many homeless people here is because, and I work with a lot of uh, uh, you know, people that do activism in this uh, field, that work with homeless people uh, in general, um, it's, it's the number one factor is that they get priced out of the housing market. So I call this the different tiers of homelessness because the most public facing side of homelessness is oftentimes the, the, uh, the person that you see on the street that has like leathery skin at this point from being under the sun, from sun damage, sun exposure for many, many years, who clearly is not mentally well, right? Um, that is the last tier of homelessness. That is the, the uh, type of homelessness that like this person is going to be profoundly hard to recover and prof profoundly hard to reintegrate into society and, and needs a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, that number is growing in California as well. But there is an invisible side of homelessness that a lot of people don't even recognize that actually makes up the largest percentage of homeless people. The invisible homelessness uh, comes from people who are housing insecure, people who are couch surfing, people who are living in their cars but still keep up appearances, mm -hmm. have a job, people that don't have access to like, uh, you know, don't have immediate access to like running water, right? But can still figure it out by like going to the gym and like having a gym membership living in their car, but then, you know, cleaning themselves up before a job interview or, you know, before going into work. That is the first stage of homelessness. That's the most common version of homelessness. That is the most recoverable form of homelessness. And that is almost entirely due to 
you know, obviously market conditions as well, like, you know, the job sector layoffs, things of that nature. But the most common reason for that homelessness to exist, the largest pocket is that they get priced out of the housing market. They uh, have a job, but they their commute expands dramatically, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually makes it more costly for them when they live like, you know, uh, 40, 50 minutes away. Ruins the quality of life. But let's say we don't even care about that at this point. Um, they, they're forced to move somewhere far away and they can't keep the jobs that they originally had. The job still exists, but mm -hmm. it's much, much, much more difficult to, uh, you know, go to it now. A lot of people have a hard time keeping jobs like that. They get fired. Um, all of a sudden, you know, you, you no longer have access to, you know, clean water. You have your car. Uh, you're having a hard time. You're being harassed by cops regularly because you can't park everywhere. You know what I mean? You're, you're being called a vagrant, whatever. Then you move into tier two homelessness, which is also another massive pocket where it becomes permanent. Like your condition basically becomes permanent. Now, one thing that I always like to stress is that, uh, you know, even bears and animals in the wild need shelter for survival. You need a fucking cave, right? You need something to burrow inside of. You don't just like brave the elements. Mm -hmm. And as humans, I, I feel like we're all, you know, I don't know if you guys are vegans or not, but like we're all a little bit specious, right? We think humans are the apex predator. We think we're a little bit better off than like, you know, monkeys and, and the like. We are... Um, when you are shut off from having access to shelter with no recourse, with no way of like recovering that over an extended period of time, that is an insanely traumatic experience. You start developing PTSD. There's a lot of crime that goes on in homeless communities as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there's back and forth assault, rape, uh, and the like. And then um, you also don't have access to healthcare, obviously. So you start both self-medicating in some ways, and also simultaneously trying to make money. Start selling drugs. Start taking the drugs, you start selling the drugs, and that completely built, uh, like paired up with the trauma of not having shelter and not having any job opportunities pushes you into the last, the final stage of homelessness where you see like a lot of mental illness, a lot of drug abuse, and even more assaults, and even more uh, you know, rape and, and uh, horrific things that uh, people have to go through. Yeah. I've definitely seen a very extreme side of things growing up and living in West LA um, up until really 2020 where most of the people that I would see visually, I think had a mental illness, were yeah. severely addicted to drugs. And I think there's no resources out there that address those. No. And there was a property that I was considering purchasing that was right by Venice Beach. And it was down the street from the new homeless shelter that was there. That, that was the one that everyone was upset about because it was in the middle of Venice. And I think the average cost was like $500,000 a room. People said, why do they need to be right in the middle of Venice at such a high cost? And the benefit would be if you sold that to a developer, the money that that person would bring in to the community could more than pay for so much more shelter. Why, why is it here? But I remember following up on that because I knew it was such a big deal for that community. And throughout a lot of the process, it was never more than I believe 60% occupied because they enforced a dry policy that yes. they could not... Uh, bring in drugs, alcohol, be drunk. Um, You're nailing it. Yeah. This is this is you're absolutely correct. But, but I've also seen a side of it where people just did not want to assimilate back into a community that they felt more free. I'm not saying this is everyone, but they felt more free, not you know participating in society and having that uh, freedom really to to do it. What, what, what you're want. describing yeah. is is actually 100 percent correct. Yeah. Homeless shelters are actually more violent spaces for a lot of homeless people than, than the opposite. You would think like, what the fuck? That's a shelter. That's like so much better. It's not. It's actually where, uh, the, where a lot of the assaults and a lot of the robberies are committed. Um, and on top of that, uh, if you have items that you care about mm -hmm. or even like a dog, for example, you can't bring your dog Correct. and you can't, you have to go cold turkey if you're on drugs. Mm -hmm. Um, if you have any sort of like abuse and substance issues, you have to go cold turkey. Um, so a lot of people choose not to do that. And while we all probably look to that and go, oh, fuck off. You don't have any fucking rights. You know, uh, why go to the shelter and fix yourself up? 
the reality is that that is actually as far as like a compassionate and more ethical approach to homelessness the the reality is that this is why a lot of people advocate for housing first homelessness policies where um where where people have some semblance of autonomy still to to begin the healing process the mental health and and the you know substance abuse therapy process um uh, that that is a more permanent and also a more secure way to deal with this uh, with this issue. But that's on the tackling the the existing homelessness part. What I was talking about with respect to housing is usually tackling it on the other side because there's two sides of this rope. You gotta you gotta shut off this part and you gotta shut off this part. Mm -hmm. This part is co being caused by uh, you know this part is being caused by uh, a a lack of access to like affordable housing and being priced out of the housing market. This part is just way more complicated. You have to actually convince uh, people to to go into housing, even if you offer permanent shelter. Sometimes homeless people don't want it; they don't trust it, and they're scared. And and you know there is a there is a mechanism of enforcement that you need to engage with there. But I mean that requires hiring a, a fuckload of social workers, and and uh, you know genuinely trying to tackle this issue instead of just kind of. You know, playing uh, chicken with uh, with the homeless encampments and just like pushing them one street over, and then being like, "Oh, we solved yeah. the problem." You know what I mean? Like, look, yeah. I mean, that's certainly something. But where should that be for homeless people? Should that be in the Pacific Palisades? Should that be Beverly Hills? What's to say it shouldn't be in Santa Monica, but it's okay in Riverside? I think that it should be wherever homeless people are. I think that um, as far as like, it's not even shelters. Uh, Housing first policies should exist in in most communities. I uh, I think that it would genuinely, in the long term, benefit those communities because then you just don't have homeless people in the fucking but streets. Let's like, say defecating. You let's know what say I mean? Santa Monica would be a, a prime example Fine. of that. Yeah, it brings in a lot of business, a lot of technology, a lot of really wealthy people. Mm -hmm. If you were to put uh, a community of homeless people in the middle of that and say this is where they are and therefore that's where we should build for homeless it would drive out a lot of the people because they would feel less safe um, they wouldn't want to do business there and I feel like property probably make the housing I'll probably make the housing market a little bit better in Santa Monica <laughs> well the issue well then you get property values going down you get less commerce in Santa Monica the area slowly degenerates and I feel like then that would continue to spread so like overall the benefit would be lower then if you say we're going to put money into mental health, into drug addiction, it doesn't need to be in the middle of the city, but it could exist over here uh, where land is more affordable and our, uh, our opportunity cost is lower, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Well, the way I see it as, as someone, you know, who owns a house mm -hmm. in West Hollywood, as someone who uh, lived in these neighborhoods that you speak of as well, I, I lived in Brentwood before, uh, in in you know more affordable apartments which was fucking awful still but expensive yeah, yeah but still incredibly expensive with many many roommates um i think that the option is do you want homeless people to keep moving around and shitting on the streets or do you want them to shit in the toilet with a roof over their head and i think like if that is the alternative and what you bring up with Venice is actually a good idea because, I mean, a, a, not a perfect solution yeah. because ultimately that didn't eradicate homelessness in Venice, yeah. right? Um, but uh, with with some genuine changes into the way that like the shelters process works with like hopes for permanent shelter solutions, yeah. uh, which currently are non-existent. Right. I think that uh, it doesn't matter where you put these these places. Like it doesn't matter where you have, um, you know, rehab facilities, yeah. for example. Because like, like, think yeah. about it this way: property in Malibu is so expensive, mm -hmm. right? Well, you know what Malibu has a fuck ton of rehab facilities. Does that change the property value? No. Why? Because the people that are going to those rehab facilities are rich people. They're the rich people rehab facilities. <laughs> so but they also aren't necessarily the ones defecating on the street. And I feel like the defecating on the street 
usually is an indicator of severe mental illness to the point where they cannot function yeah. on their own without assistance. And those would not be the people who could well, voluntarily go and like, I'm going to apply. Also, that's not entirely way. correct either. Not 100%. But I would say... Because in a lot of instances, majority. it's just like, we don't have public bathrooms. You know what I mean? So where the fuck is he supposed to shit, right? Yeah. Every but, other country no, I'm you talking go about to. the extremes where, you yeah. know, I used to work in West Hollywood and I would see people out yeah. front on Sunset Plaza pulling their pants down in front of traffic and just, you yeah. know... Um, yeah, people... Are, are severely and and uh, like genuinely cripplingly mentally ill due to the circumstances that I described. Um, and those people need help. And part of that help comes from, again, like not directly institutionalizing those people, but some level of institutionalization mm -hmm. in a, a significantly more empathetic and significantly more compassionate and more ethical ways. I would agree with that. And and I think that this is something that like everyone kind of agrees on. Yeah. But there's a very uh, you know there's a very shitty part of this conversation that uh, we will never agree on, which is the unfortunate reality that like housing prices might need to be devalued a little bit in the process of like building or or um, not completely abolishing zoning restrictions in its entirety. But at least like allowing for uh, or, or allowing for certain types of housing to be developed in communities. California has a 55 percent home ownership rate. Homeowners are very powerful as an as an entity here in this in the state. They don't want any housing. They don't want any housing. To be built. I agree with you on that. That's something that I've said is that the building process in Los Angeles specifically is so terrible. It is so bad. I made a video on this years ago about the process it takes to build a multifamily building here in LA. The amount of open space that you need to account for, the amount of parking. Parking is a huge one. Even if you're close to nearby yeah. transit, you need a certain amount of parking spaces for the amount of bedrooms that you have per square foot, in addition to common space, open area, all of these things that make the cost so unbelievably high to build any sort of multifamily here in Los Angeles. And so for a developer, for it to even make financial sense to break even, they have to build luxury units. That's the only thing that they could build. Otherwise, there's no financial, but they would lose money on that. Yeah. But also building ADUs is so difficult in Los Angeles. And they came out with this program a few years ago saying, like, I we're remember. gonna, we're gonna uh, accept most ADUs. And I was really looking forward to this because I have a duplex and I'd love to turn the garage at that point into another unit, two units. And there was a proposal that would allow you to build five stories if you were within, I think it was like a mile from a major intersection or half a mile from public transit. And I was so looking forward to that because I could take that duplex and build five to six units and that would provide a lot more housing. And everyone in my neighborhood would be able to do that. But that failed because people didn't want, and I kind of understand if, if you're a house you don't want to be necessarily living next to five stories and have people look down in your backyard and lose that privacy. And like, I, I get that too, but they make buildings so difficult here in LA. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. I think that they do that deliberately. They do that for one, because like, uh, you know, a, a lot of people say the, their quality of life or the, the character of the neighborhood will be eviscerated, destroyed. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, or, uh, they also don't want their housing prices to devalue either technically uh, because now there's more housing uh, availability. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or because they're next to a fucking building all of a sudden. And to that I say, you know, yeah, there's going to be some, there's going to be a little bit of struggle there. But in the long term, in the long run, it will yield tremendous benefits in the form of not having people that have been homeless for five years, six years, that's taking a shit outside of your house or just like trying to break into your fucking house, breaking into your car. Like I've, I've had, I've had all of these things happen. Um, it's a, it's the cost of living in a big city. It shouldn't have to be. There are plenty of examples of cities that have been able to eradicate this problem, not entirely, but have done a much better, uh, you know, have dealt with it much better. Like what cities? Um, I am, of course, going to bring up, if you are not familiar with this, I'm surprised, uh, Red Vienna. Uh, Austria is the country we're talking about. In Vienna, 65% of uh, all homes are actually public housing. They are not-for-profit housing, basically. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's a concept where the government offers many benefits to develop housing and then, and then basically have the rent... Uh, exist specifically to either further develop more public housing 
or to maintain the housing itself. Housing that is not created with the sole purpose of accumulating uh, more value to the single sole owner or, or whatever corporation owns it, but instead housing created uh, by, by basically taking away some of the barriers of developing this project uh, that can only be done by the government, um, like offering a lot for a dollar um, with the express purpose of like building cooperatively owned housing mm -hmm. and then uh, working with like credit unions to, to basically get investment in, like to get a loan from a bank uh, only to have the existing property once it's, you know, completed and built uh, and the rent in said existing property pay for mm -hmm. the... Uh, pay for the mortgage See, and I've, the maintenance yeah. fees. I've seen quite a few countries offer that of like a dollar. But in a lot of those instances, it's usually to promote people to move into a city that no one else wants to live in or that is declining in population. They need more people in there. And so they use that as a resort to say, hey, come here. Be no different than people like, you know, doing that in Riverside and saying like, hey, we want more people over here. We want to be more of a hub. Uh, but I think Los Angeles and a lot of California specifically, um, in, in the higher price neighborhoods, they want to attract top talent and they want people like that to move here and innovate. Mm -hmm. And they don't have a problem with declining population to that extent where they have to incentivize people and land is so expensive. I don't think it should be uh, a byproduct. Vancouver doesn't have a declining population, uh, but it's not, it's not to incentivize more people to move in. It's to basically, uh, uh, it's, it's to basically do the, the lightest form of government intervention you can do and utilize the same capitalistic system and the same structures without like completely undermining it to offer affordable housing as a low cost uh, alternative. But because that system is not funded at all and has actually been, uh, you know, disfavored by homeowners and, and uh, you know, all of these people that are incentivized to consistently keep their housing prices up in places like Amsterdam, uh, the number of cooperatively owned uh, nonprofit housing uh, units have declined. And that's why even in a place like Amsterdam, for example, you see since the 2000s, the cost of living fucking skyrocket and become a genuine problem. So where do you draw the line then between public housing and, and becoming a landlord? I mean, do you think like a, a property like this should be owned by the government and someone should have to pay way less because it's owned by the government? Like, should someone have the right to live in West Hollywood, for instance, yeah, if, if I think that I think if if like I am not in the business of like completely eradicating private home ownership, I am a private homeowner myself. What I simply want to do is make it unaffordable for people to generate and accumulate capital from a home that they're not living inside of a home that they're basically renting out. That's what it means to decommodify housing. Now, that's a very long term goal. And obviously, that's not going to be happening anytime soon in the United States of America. So the solutions I present in the interim period in the short term is to literally just like eviscerate the problem that currently yeah. exists with homelessness. Like, yeah. So let's discuss this on an ethical level, because mm -hmm. I think that would be really fun, because I know you two have very different opinions on the ethics of land ownership slash obviously being a landlord. Sure. Graham has his own unique experiences because he's a, obviously a property owner like that. And you probably have your own respective opinion. Let's hear what you have to say about that. I mean, I think that um, I think that uh, shutting off a necessary resource by, you know, by making it uh, a profitable business, a profitable venture is like something that I'm entirely against. If you want to still, you know, do that. Uh, you know, you could do commercial real estate, which is a whole how different is that any of worms. Different because it's from a business. Like yeah, but let's say it's a mom and pop business. How is that any different from a household? I feel like a like a, a a family is also a business. They have to run a business just the same way as a mom and pop liquor store on the corner would have to run a business. You're mm -hmm. taking in money. You have expenses. You have to save a little bit for a rainy day. Yeah, wouldn't that be the same thing? No, because you don't have to live inside of your your you don't have to live inside of your uh, business in the same way. A business can thrive and survive even if the, the barrier in that regard exists, right? A business can still uh, get a bank loan to be able to pay for these sorts of things. Whereas like, I think the similar process should not exist for home ownership. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't getting a loan be the same thing as renting a house from a landlord? Because then you're owing money 
to someone else, probably the government, who you're going to be paying 5 to 7% interest to. Yeah, I mean, in some respects, absolutely. Well, obviously, we don't have like Soviet bloc style public housing in this country. So I'm just simply saying that like in the short term, these are the, uh, this is what I advocate for in the short term to like at least tackle some of the issues with availability of housing that creates homelessness. From my perspective, I see landlords as providing a service and, and I'm trying not to like include the slumlords because there's certainly people that do the bare minimum, like just basic above like the bare minimum living conditions to try to maximize profit. But yeah. talking about like a lot of landlords that I see, the vast majority are mom and pop. They own three or fewer properties. They a lot of times have owned properties from their parents. They just turn into rentals. They've, they own a, the house. Instead of selling it, they'll choose to rent it out to someone else while they buy something else and then eventually rent that. But from what I've seen and what, what I've seen a lot of people do is that they'll buy a property that, that no one else would consider. And these would be properties that need a lot of work that maybe an owner user user doesn't have the funds to fix up. They don't have the time. They don't have the interest. Someone else goes and fixes that up and rents it out to someone who doesn't want to own a home. And there's a lot of people out there that renting is more beneficial than owning. If they're only going to live there for a few years, if they just want to test out an area, home ownership is, is, is really burdensome as I'm sure you've seen with property taxes, insurance, repairs, miscellaneous things. Right now it's cheaper to rent than it is to own throughout the majority of Los Angeles. I think ultimately the sense of security that you get from having permanent shelter when you're a homeowner is, is, you know, much, much better overall than, than having uh, the fear of, you know, your landlord literally changing your rent just because they can, because the market conditions are favorable to, to do such a thing. Um, and uh, regardless of that though, mm-hmm. I mean, like I said, uh, public housing does not necessarily have to mean permanent shelter in the sense that like you own the house that you're in. Mm -hmm. Um, Singapore, I think, has a a system similar to that as well, where you're basically leasing it for the government. Right. Um, And and, you know, these are places where they've been able to tackle this crisis head on before it even existed. And it still works on a rental basis. If you want the opportunity to rent a home, you can absolutely do so. I guess the way I see the world is that um, I wish for a future where people don't even need to be mom and pop landlords uh, as a as a nest egg for survival that like they they like they, they don't need to even do that because a lot of those things are taken care of through social safety nets when you are no longer a productive laborer when you have retired. But of course, that uh, is a, a fuckload of yeah. other issues as how, well. How would that play in though if you want a higher quality of living beyond that? Like, would, let's say let's say that you don't want that and you want to be able to make more money or work harder and get something nicer. Then go ahead. I mean, it's not. I'm. Yeah. What I'm talking about with respect to like full blown decommoditize uh, decommodifying housing is again so far out in the future that it's like unimaginable to talk about from today's standards of living and the way that we experience society right, right now because there are other complications that uh, that that exist there. Like, for example, housing is not the only issue. Uh, part of the, the problem that I mentioned is commutes and travel, right? Mm-hmm. One way to make traffic congestion uh, infinitely more, uh, infinitely better and more livable in a place like California is public transit. We're very spread out. But unfortunately, we also have made zero attempts to better our public transit system in this in the state in general, and certainly not in Los Angeles. Um, that is also a necessity. Walkability, like making walkable cities and and uh, making this city more walkable and simultaneously have better public transit options is an absolute necessity for uh, low income people to yeah. survive. I would love to see micro apartments. I'm talking like 300, 250 (laughs) square foot. That's what I would have loved. When I was 20, 21 years old, you're working all day, you're out and about, you could live in the central part of wherever you want to live, and that's all you need. You need a bed, a kitchen, a TV, bathroom, 300 square feet. I, no, I I don't think, I don't think that's a solution. I, I mean, it's just like, Sure, if you if you want to create an opportunity for like cheaper living, that's fine. That's great. But like, I don't even think when I say affordable housing, when we talk about 
like again going back to vienna 65 percent public uh homeowner like publicly owned housing availability mm -hmm. those massive complexes that we're talking about are like luxury condominiums in comparison to what we have here as as uh, available in the private market um they have uh they have gyms they have pools they have uh some some sunlight coming in um and 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 uh, you know a, a balcony that you can you know build like a some kind of shrubbery on you know like just some some green um all of that stuff is is still very much a possibility even if it is uh, decoupled from the profit motive and we can't even think about it like that we were immediately we're like well why not still have it be private and just be cheaper overall and you know take out some of the amenities i, I don't want to do that i want to make sure that we build you know livable uh livable housing that people want to live in that uh is still kept uh, at a low cost and and more affordable that's what i think can be done and it is done in other places uh and i think that it should be done in california it would literally make this state like the number one country to live in uh because uh, you know we have a massive gdp we're mm -hmm. a very powerful economy i think it's like what fourth fifth largest economy on yeah, the planet it's pretty much the fourth largest economy yeah but where does like, the money go that's what that's what i want i can to tell know, you where the, where, where the money goes the money go the money goes to you know <laughs> gavin newsom and other people's like cousins and uncles that are like contractors and developers that uh take on and bid for these like uh viable contracts of, of like massive infrastructure projects that they have really no intention of uh fully seeing through yeah. It goes to our police force. A gigantic chunk of it goes to our police force. Every time you drive over a pothole, think like, you know, cops got a fucking armored personnel carrier, so you can't have this pothole fixed. It's it's unimaginable. Even, even then, part of me thinks that crime is escalating to a point where we need more police officers because it's so prevalent. Like, I've seen... You bring up a good point. Like, First of all, crime is not escalating technically. That is, even if you look at police numbers, police data... Crime is actually decreasing, but everywhere in the media, they're like, oh my God, crime is so bad. You would think that crime is well, worse in California yeah. than it is in like South Carolina. No, it's not. South Carolina has a much higher rate, for example, of murders but than no, New York. But Don't isn't they, that, didn't they decriminalize a lot of the things in California yeah. too? No, that's, again, a lot of this stuff is, a lot of this stuff is portrayed in the media in a way to draw out hysteria towards it. And then you see, uh, homeless people like defecating on the street and then you think oh my god the media is correct crime is fucking skyrocketing homicides are up that's true um certainly the main component though is not our police budgets because police budgets have fucking gone up year over year over year the los angeles police department spends eight million dollars a day just to operate mm -hmm. eight million dollars a day and hey if you get your fucking car broken into good luck you know you call them up right. they're like sorry Nobody on the line, you know? But you, doesn't that promote, in a way, more crime? Because what I've seen, again, this is me personally, have seen this firsthand, but the level of crime out in the open, I've never seen that before in my life as someone who worked like Beverly Hills, West Hollywood. I've never seen before someone in the broad daylight smashing a window. But over the last two years, I've seen and heard more stories firsthand about people in broad daylight being robbed for their watches, walking down the street, in a crowded space, someone pulls up, smashes a car window, grabs it, and everyone's just kind of standing there looking. The police yeah. won't respond to it because it's not worth their time. It's not. Yeah. And also, they're fucking super lazy, let's be real. Uh, but, um, yeah, there's no, there's no other sector where, like, they, you... Yeah. <laughs> there's no other sector in which people go, oh, yeah, they, they're just bad, but we like, got to give them more money. But part of me thinks it's just because there's, it's so prevalent because it's not enforced, because the, the no. penalties are not as strict as they should be for that level of crime. America houses the largest number of, uh, you know, caged people, not free people, prisoners on the planet. We are 4% of the entire planet's uh, population, and yet we have 25% of the entire planet's prisoner population. We have a very draconian attitude towards crime and punishment. And unfortunately, in other countries where mm -hmm. they have a much more understanding approach that focuses on rehabilitation, they have better results of reintegration. They have yeah. lower recidivism rates. It is demonstrably failed. Our carceral state is an 
abject failure. We've even profit. We've even baked in the profit incentive into it in the mm-hmm. form of private prisons, which are just abhorrent by, uh, you know, uh, other other country standards. Yeah. Norway literally has a non extradition treaty for uh, many crimes to the United States because they consider U.S. prisons to be uh, a, a, a regularly violating human rights, solitary confinement. And even like regular uh, prisons, like regular jails, like Rikers and whatnot, uh, should be shut down, but uh, are currently operating with like millions of people. I mean, not millions, but thousands of people that are uh, that are going through that jail system without even a court date. The we have we have basically proven time and time again that like these kinds of you know we're gonna fucking tackle crime head on by you know beating people's heads in. Uh, not working is is just a failure. In other places mm-hmm. where they don't do that, it's not a failure. What is the main difference, though? It's because crime doesn't happen because people are bad people. Certainly, there are still, of course, going to be perverts, freaks, whatever you know, antisocial personality disorder uh, related crimes. But crime, for the most part, is a consequence of your material conditions. That's why when there's more poverty like in a state like South Carolina, there's more crime. There's more violent crime. And the unfortunate reality is that we rarely ever try to tackle the underpinnings of why crime happens. Mm -hmm. And then we try to do this patchwork solution of like more police enforcement, which ironically then takes funds away from the ways to maybe even deal with why crime happens. And you know, when there's less funding for after school programs, mm-hmm. when there's less funding for education, when there's less funding for for, uh, you know, any kind of affordable solutions to the housing crisis. All of a sudden you have more people that are desperate. You have more people that are just like willing to say, fuck it. I'm crazy. I'm just going to go, you know, bash someone's head in and steal their watch, or, or rob them at at gunpoint. That is a reality that has been consistent and has been endlessly pontificated on since ancient Greece. The, the relationship that crime has with poverty. Mm-hmm. And yet, for some reason, we just like to turn a blind eye to it here in the United States and, and refuse to implement actual solutions that would tackle it head on. Meanwhile, there are examples, even if they are not, you know, perfect, even if they haven't completely eviscerated crime, right? Um, you know, violent crime, gun violence, uh, and and even, you know, um, thefts, yeah. grand larceny, have uh, are are comparably much much better. Like those rates are much much better in other countries where they have social safety yeah. nets. Why do you feel like, and perhaps this is just me making assumptions, that crime has gotten worse since COVID, even during the times that stimulus checks and employment benefits were going out? That's a great question. Um, crime has historically uh, gotten lower year over year up until 2019. And then in 2020, it actually diminished dramatically because of the things that you're mentioning. And also on top of uh, on top of that, people were not able to travel as freely. Mm -hmm. Um, So it literally just completely suppressed crime. Right. A lot of economic factors were were uh, helpful in tackling that aspect. But then after uh, the, the stimulus checks ran out. And after uh, people were able to, you know, go back to their regular order of business, go and, and travel freely and, and, and walk around, mm. it seemed like in comparison to 2020 and 2021, crime started skyrocketing. Well, yes, in comparison to 2020, yes, the year after and the year and since then, crime has gone up. And now it's ba- basically catching up to 2019 levels and maybe depending on homicide, for example, it's, it's even higher than 2019 levels. Mm-hmm. But other than that, crime is still consistently lower year over year. It just depends on what snapshot you're looking at. But when you see a big boost like that in the numbers mm-hmm. for, uh, in comparison to the year prior, and you have a media that is like very excited to, you know, ramp up the, the hysteria and the, and the, you know, uh, if it bleeds, it leads uh, style attitudes that they have when they when they keep pushing for this narrative and you have a police union that uh, sees a lot of scrutiny when you have police uh, see a lot of scrutiny at the national level through, you know, police brutality becoming a more prominent uh, conversation point. Um, how, what are you what are you supposed to do against that? How do you counter uh, against that narrative? You say, well, they're trying to defund us. 
there has not been any significant defunding movement that has existed in any state, any municipality across the United States of America. They say the police have been defunded here in Los Angeles, for example. I'm a taxpayer here. I probably pay for more Kevlar vests and more guns than many of your viewers and, and maybe even some of them combined. Let's be real. Uh, and and I could tell you with a certainty that police have not been defunded in Los Angeles. As a matter of fact, they've gotten more funds in comparison to the year prior and the year prior to that as well. Um, their overtime benefits have, have skyrocketed as well. That's one way that like police actually make a lot of their money is overtime. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think what ended up happening in order to like, I guess, uh, satiate the masses that were asking for some level of accountability from the police, our neoliberal administrators decided, what do we do? Instead of giving them 200 million extra dollars this year, we'll give them 150 million extra dollars this year. We'll just shave a little bit off the top of what extra money that we were going to give to the police as a rate increase. And then how do they make up for that? Of course, they made up for that with COVID funds, which Joe Biden has uh, openly stated can be used to pay overtime and, and the police force to continue funding the police. Don't they need more money because of rising costs in general, whether that be for their families, the cost of cars, gasoline, Kevlar, the cost of everything has gone up. So if they cut extra funds, that is also in addition to their own costs probably going up by 20%. Well, but they haven't really cut funds like that. You know what I mean? They, they, they keep funding the police uh, very thoroughly and, and very handsomely at the opportunity cost of not funding other places that desperately need it significantly more than the police, as a matter of fact, like education, like mm -hmm. the roads and the like. Every single thing that you see, that's why I always say, every single thing that you see in California, we're like, how the fuck is this still, like, how is this pothole still here? You know yeah. what I mean? That's crazy. Yeah. Like, fix the fucking potholes. It's like, yeah, can't, because a lot of our funds are currently being used elsewhere. Um, it's it's like a business. Everything is a business, yeah. right? What do you do when you're when you have a unlimited money supply? Okay, year over year, you're gonna find a way to spend it, so you can keep asking for it and even ask for more. Everyone massages the numbers in that regard. If you've ever worked for a corporation, you know they do it all the time. They want to make sure that you know their budgets look good. They're gonna always find a way to spend it. Yep. There's never a moment where police go, maybe we should do a little bit of belt tightening. There's never austerity towards police. Yeah. There's only austerity towards education year over year. I feel like that's not a problem with the police. That's just a problem with the whole California system where if any company, government funded, says, I don't spend this amount of money that I'm given, I'm not going to get more the next year. And I'm going to seem like a failure. If I get $20 million budget, I need to spend the whole thing to be able to get that again. And if I spend 15, well, now I'm going to be limited to 15 the next year. Audit it. Have some, have some fucking number crunchers in there go, no, not anymore. We're not doing this. I think we should do that. I think that would be great. Yeah. I am, I'm in favor of implementing uh, efficiency protocols and eliminating redundancy. Me too. As, 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 uh, as vicious as like a Bain capital guy or, a, you know, a, a McKinsey consultant when it comes to uh, something that is as expansive and not yielding the results that it's supposed to like the police force yeah what would you decriminalize if you were to say one thing uh that should not be enforced the way it is i think if, if anything decriminalization is a tricky subject to discuss because i think that decriminalization without anything else is just like you're not doing anything you know what i mean if if you're decriminalizing a certain thing you also have to have preventative mechanisms put in place. Decriminalization of drugs, for example, is profoundly successful in the nation of Portugal, mm -hmm. right? But what do they do? They didn't just decriminalize drug usage, right? They also, on top of that, uh, uh, created systems uh, that they implemented immediately, like uh, that, that eliminated needle sharing, that uh, basically offered up uh, rehabilitation opportunities for people who were you know, regular substance abusers. And that was profoundly successful in cutting back uh, both the usage and, and drug consumption in general, but it was also uh, profoundly successful in, in cutting back uh, on, you know, secondary complications that come from needle sharing like AIDS uh, and, and uh, you know, hepatitis C and, and the like, like a lot of uh, 
transmittable mm-hmm. diseases that that uh, people get. Uh, and people were able to go to rehab. If you consider drug usage, for example, to be just a criminal act, and if you if the, your only solution to drugs is you know the police force and and jailing, then you know you you arrive at uh, the problem that we have with the war on drugs, where the drugs yeah. still won and the, the remnants of, of that still exist. Um, you know, think about it like the way we treat rich people. Like when a rich person has a substance abuse problem, they don't see the the worst impacts. They don't they don't get fucking thrown in jail for the most part or brutalized by police. They go to rehab. And in a lot of instances, it might not even be successful, but in plenty of instances, it is. It's mm-hmm. just a more ethical way of dealing with it and also a more successful way of dealing with it if you look to other countries that have implemented similar processes. So that's one area that I would decriminalize. Another one okay. that I would decriminalize is sex work, for sure. Again. Yeah, I'd agree with both of those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why don't you think they've decriminalized sex work? Wouldn't that legitimize the industry, prevent a lot of sex trafficking, make sure yeah. that people are safer? Yeah, so absolutely. That. Why do you think we've not done that? Do you think it's more of like a like a moral, religious? America is very puritanical, yeah. and oftentimes we engage in like nonsensical acts. Like even if the majority of the public doesn't agree with it, mm-hmm. not saying that like the public loves sex work or anything, but the greatest example that comes to mind is abortion. You know what I mean? It was such an insane, like such an insane thing to do, and you still have places like Kentucky where you know it's a ballot measure where they're like, we are going to codify abortion protections. And then uh, and then the people overwhelmingly vote for that, right? That's the most democracy you can get. A ballot measure is the most direct democracy, right? You go in, you say, no, I want to protect abortions, and you fucking press the button or you yeah. fill it in. And and Kentucky overwhelmingly voted in favor of, of codifying and protecting abortions. The Kentucky Attorney General, Mitch McConnell's very own guy, uh, you know, who's... Is, it turned around and said, "No, we're still gonna, we're still gonna work to criminalize abortion." Insane. Mm-hmm. Why are we doing that? Well, because we need to have wedge issues. We need to have a culture war. We need to have a back and forth. Even if there is no such back and forth, and the overwhelming majority of people think it's like completely unjustifiable to criminalize abortion and and allow women to have bodily autonomy, and and you know, not have the government interfere with a medical procedure. Um, but it doesn't matter because it gets the base riled up. It gets a very viable constituency that the Republican Party needs to hold on to riled up and go out and vote for it. So that's why they have to keep doing it over and over again. And sex work is not all that different. Um, it's a, it's something that a lot of people both engage in or consume. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, there's a sense of shame surrounding it because of our puritanical attitudes and uh, people don't usually care about it. They just have apathy for the most part. Um, so it's a very easy group of people to tackle, especially when, you know, this is an industry, like you also correctly pointed out, where sex trafficking happens, mm-hmm. right? Exploitation, grooming, and the like, or rape happens in this industry, just like it happens in every other industry. But, um, you know, decoupling that from sex work, which is done consensually amongst adults, is is uh, very very important, but instead there's a deliberate effort by you know super conservative, ultra Christian fundamentalists to never separate the two to make sure that there's a conflation so that they can consistently say, what you want sex crimes to continue, you mm-hmm. want sex trafficking to continue. We need to destroy sex work in its entirety. It's a, every every single time uh, there is a coercion happening, every single time that there is uh, you know. A crime happening anytime there's a you know any kind of pornographic material being shot. Mm-hmm. What are some personal values that you hold that is not also held by the political party that you associate with? I mean, I there's a lot. Pretty much everything I hold on to, I don't think the Democratic Party genuinely cares about. They claim to care about it, but I don't think they care about any of it. So I would say almost all of what I believe in the Democratic Party is not in support of. What do you think the Democratic Party is doing right? And what do you think that they're doing wrong? And then can you also do that for the Republican Party? Yeah, they're doing everything wrong. They're not doing anything right. The Democratic Party we're talking <laughs> yes. about. Okay. Yes, they're doing everything wrong. Um, they are, they basically play the role of a bottleneck for like any kind of genuine progressive momentum. 
Uh, they don't offer nearly enough labor protections, like at all. They have not refunded the NLRB after Donald Trump, you know, defunded it. Uh, they are, I mean, there are notable exceptions to this, but overall the party view and the party attitude towards like even increasing the minimum wage or things like that, that could technically be done through budget reconciliation, mm -hmm. never came down to it because they looked at the first tiny marginal hurdle and said, oh, we can't do it because the Senate parliamentarian said we can't do it. And it's like fucking bullshit. Like, um, if you get down to the, the, the thick of it or the weeds of it, when you look at uh, all of these structural hurdles, the Republican Party eviscerates them regularly. Okay, they routinely will say, ah, fuck precedent. I don't give a shit. We're going to do it. I mean, look no further than the Federalist Society from its development to its inception to all the way to now where they have been able to dismantle abortion protections in the Supreme Court. That took like it was 40 years uh, long effort, but it was successful. You know, they don't give a shit about what the impacts of this might be on the ground. So I think in many respects, the Republican Party does a very good job of one, creating uh, culture wars to fight and setting the terms of that battle, and then two, implementing measures that uh, make it feel like they're actually successful and that they're giving something to their audiences, that they're giving something to their constituencies. Whereas the Democratic Party constantly is in a state of panic and defense, but that defense, whenever they're in positions of power, never actually comes to fruition, and they just kind of let a lot of it slide, let a lot of it go. So... As far as that goes, I think uh, whether it be environmental protections, Joe Ban Joe, I was gonna call him Joe Brandon because that's what I do on stream all the all the time. <laughs> Joe Biden, um, Joe Biden talks a big game about environmental protection, but then offers you know a litany of pipelines to open up, um, and uh, you know no no such genuine effort to like take away subsidies in the fossil fuel industry and like refocusing our efforts to become competitive against China in the field of like uh, renewable energy is ever truly made because the oil industry has America in a stranglehold. You know, they can do whatever the fuck they want. But under the Obama administration, the, the Democratic Party had a supermajority in the Senate when they were trying to implement uh, ACA. And then uh, a senator died. He was replaced by, oh, fuck, what's his name? Oh, this is the worst. Okay, well, I can't figure it out. That's there was fine. one senator whose name is literally... I'm blanking out on right now. It's very frustrating who played the role of, of the one guy who was not going to vote for it. And, and, you know, that's why the, the Democrats had to set up a, a litany of compromises mm -hmm. and couldn't go far enough. But the reality is that as a unit, as a whole, they do not want to make genuine system breaking changes that they advocate for that I consider to be a necessity because they're still funded by the same corporate benefactors for the most part. So you're of the mindset that there are like this small group of elites that basically run the everything to a certain extent. I mean, if you consider that to be capital owners in general, then yes, I, I do. I think that this country was built by capital owners for capital owners. This entire system of governance is built for uh, corporate owners to get whatever they want, uh, whatever their desires are. And it's not even like individual, like it, it's more so the structure itself benefits those who are wealthy, um, whether it be tax incentives when you're richer. Uh, and I, I see it in my personal experience as someone who made $21,000 the first year, my first year of employment to now, like I see the, the, the many different opportunities where like it is significantly cheaper to be wealthy than it is to be broke. It is much more expensive to be broke. Um, you know, you're, you're, but don't you feel like that also gives you opportunity of upward mobility, no matter where you start from? Cause you would be a great example of that, of coming to America, starting off earning very little, but finding a category that you excelled in and innovating in that and providing value in that and reaping the rewards of that. Well, luckily for us, we don't have to speculate on this because uh, upward social mobility is something that people track regularly. Mm -hmm. And uh, the United States actually falls far, significantly far behind other countries that have social safety nets. Um, every European social democracy absolutely destroys the United States on upward social mobility. Because when you don't have access to amenities, you are shutting off a, a massive talent pool of people that uh, might be unimaginably creative, but 
they never get a chance to even express so, that because they don't have the economic freedom. But to then, do so. if that's the case, why wouldn't like rich kids predominantly produce more than people growing up in poverty? Because from what I've seen, just anecdotally, people who grew up poor without a lot of money or resources often have a drive that people with resources don't utilize or appreciate. I think that that probably comes from having so much security that uh, your your drive is diminished. Like, I think you see a similar thing with immigrants that are coming into this country, especially. Um, by the third generation, full assimilation has happened and, you know, test results go down. You've become a full-blown American. Uh, you, you, are, you don't have that same motivation mm -hmm. of, like, you know, uh, working super hard. I think that that's a... a byproduct but it doesn't bear itself out in the de in the data in a similar way um like yeah sure super wealthy people and their children oftentimes are fucking fail sons you know it's a very common thing that you see now of course they're fail sons but they still end up making their way uh through society in a way that like a poor person's child would never be able to you know what i mean like they're still I mean, George W. Bush was the president. He is the ultimate fail son. You know what I mean? He got to the fucking tippy top. Donald Trump was a major fail son. Every business that he got into, he fucked up. Every single one. Uh, his father, Fred Trump, famously had to consistently keep loaning him money uh, for his casino operations in Atlantic City over and over again. And then he still ended up defaulting it because there were measures set in place for the wealthy to never truly fail, Right. And if you take advantage of that, you can <laughs> become president one day. So, you know, as far as uh, as far as the data goes, it, it certainly shows that, you know, sure, there might be fail sons who are abject failures, ultimately, that come from like really wealthy backgrounds. But um, ultimately, when you when you give more opportunity to people, more economic freedoms to people, especially people that are coming from much poorer backgrounds or middle class backgrounds, they make more with less. Who do you think are political commentators on the left that you don't have a bunch of respect for? You think that they like they're basically too aggressive or they lie or something like that. And who are some on the right that you do and don't have respect for? I I don't have an issue with like any political commentators on the left overall. I uh, you know, there might be people that I don't really talk about in general, but mm -hmm. other than that, like I, I, no matter what people say or no matter what they even say about me, what, whatever their particular opinion might be, I'm often of the mindset that, uh, there's too much, uh, sectarian infighting over like marginal issues that people get very passionate about. And, uh, as long as someone is united in, um, you know, trying to tackle the problems that we talked about, I don't care what their political ideology is, as long as they're open-minded and charitable. So I don't really have an issue with like any, I guess, leftist commentators. There aren't that many to begin with. A lot of them are my friends. Uh, you know, the Chapo boys come to mind. Uh, you know, they're great. They have a podcast, the Chapo Trap House, if you guys are unfamiliar. Um, and um, that's it. As far as right-wing commentators goes, I think that uh, there are a lot of, there is a predisposition to exaggerate or even, you know, advocate for things that you might not necessarily believe in in your mm -hmm. real life on the right. People say that about me all the time, which is funny, but um, I think that it is a much more viable industry to be in if you want to just like say whatever to an audience that's like really, really excited to hear it. And that's why you see a lot of what is known as grifters on the right. Or people who would like claim to be centrists, for example. Tim Pool would be a good example of this. He always says he's a liberal or he's a centrist, but then he's like, you look at his commentary and you're like, are you really a centrist? Um, so, you know, I think that uh, the the entirety of right wing commentary sphere, I I have uh, no respect for if that's the right way to go about it. I mean, they're they're great businessmen and women, but I think that they're the way that they view the world or at least the the propaganda that they cut is genuinely bad i i don't agree and i think that it stands against everything i believe in it stands against everything i advocate for we might find common ground on certain issues but even then 
I think that that partnership is one that is like short lived for the most part. I, I asked that because we're releasing this episode back to back with an episode. We were just in Nashville. We shot with Brett Cooper, if you know who she is. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's Femme Shapiro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Young, uh, sure. That young, <laughs> young, uh, yeah, young, uh, Young Ben Shapiro, it's it's funny. I um, many many moons ago, someone was like, "Yo, this person is like, look at this young young Ben Shapiro, uh, cut out a Daily Wire, uh, and she was doing like a fake live stream, and it looked kind of weird to me because it was like not a real live stream, like, but she was like responding to chat and whatever. And I've seen um, I've seen some. Oh. No space in memory card. Oh, well, let's just—that's totally fine. Yeah, we'll just okay. That. Well, I've seen up. some uh, materials from like Turning Point USA where mm -hmm. they like openly are talking about how they want to make sure that their influencers resemble certain commentary and certain styles of commentary, and like they use me as an example. So I was like, that's kind of funny <laughs> that they're like doing like a fake live stream instead of a real one, yeah. uh, and and you know making it seem like this person is like in her room and talking when they're in a studio. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, what her perspectives are at all, I assume I would not agree with them given what I know about the Daily Wire. Um, there might be some common ground, maybe, but uh, yeah, I don't really, I don't really know too much about her. Yeah, she said I, I was hot, and so you know, <laughs> thank you. She said you were hot. Yeah, on a lie detector. <laughs> no, really. Yeah, they were doing like a lie detector test. I saw the clip, uh, and uh, you know, so. <laughs> Thanks. Our, our goal is really not to take a side, but to hear both perspectives mm -hmm. and let the audience come to their own decision and be re like 100% respectful to every person that comes on the show mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and hear out other opinions that are, you know, even if they're not our own, but we give them a chance and we listen, listen to them and hear them out. So. Yeah. All right. So yeah. I got two more questions. They're going to be rapid fire questions. Start it off with something light. Okay. Something easy. What's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of life? Mm -hmm. um, the avoidance of pain and the maximization of pleasure for all people, not just individually, but for everyone. Life is short. Uh, I think we should enjoy things. We should allow ourselves to enjoy things and uh, we should help others uh, in that similar pursuit. Okay. And but of if, course, yeah. I'm not saying like fucking eat donuts every goddamn day and become a schlub. <laughs> I get a I think lot of that, pleasure from that though, man. Well, true. But having said that, being healthy is also very pleasurable and it will allow you more opportunities to seek pleasures uh, on top of that. So okay. you're not cutting yeah. your life off, you know? Yeah. Finally, if you were to become president, what, what would you do? I would. <laughs> yeah, that's a rapid fire question. That's rapid not a rapid fire, fire. man. Rapid right. fire. Quick, There's quick. a lot. There's a lot I would do. <laughs> I, I don't think the, the president has all that much power against the, like, pre-existing and and like very well-defined almost fossilized institutional mm -hmm. rules and regulations but uh, i guess one of the things that i would try to do is uh, make it much much easier for workplaces to unionize and you know develop workers councils at least so that the working class can get at least some percentage of the profits that they generate back uh, because i always say it's not about being left it's not about being right it's about what's fair and i think that uh, you know, collective action in that regard offers, uh, opens up the opportunity to at least advocate for fairness in the workplace. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Asan. This has been absolutely incredible. Really Thanks for really having me. It really means a lot that you yeah. came over here. I know. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Not streaming, too, to come on yeah. here. It's an honor. Dude, thank yeah. you, man. Well, no problem. I really enjoyed this. I like going in front of different audiences, you know? Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. So thank, thank you guys man. so much for watching. And until next, until time. next time. Nice. Thank you for this, man. I really enjoyed that. Yeah,